I'm ready when you are. Jesus, the Messiah, uh, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And pretty cool when you hear a testimony of, of someone who, uh, who's been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Uh, especially someone who's fairly newly saved. Abby's fairly newly saved. I don't remember how long ago, but it was, I think, only a matter of months or so. Um, six months to a year type of a thing. And uh, she's, been, she's been pressing me to baptize her in a creek, and we lost that window. We actually were going to try to do it. There was, we almost pulled, we, we were going to schedule one for a Friday, remember? We were going to try to get in the creek, and then we all got sick. And uh, that didn't quite work out. So. And then Abby got sick. And so that held things up even more. But, um, you know, hearing a testimony of someone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, hearing a testimony of someone who Jesus has come to save, that's always pretty cool. It's always pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, so many people reject him. You know, a lot of people in our day reject him on the basis of things like tradition. Church tradition can be in some people's mind, more powerful than what God actually says. Uh, there are some denominations who, 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 in their actual theology, we would call it heretical theology, that is false doctrine, but in their theology, they equate church tradition with Scripture. And you think, how in the world can anything equate with Scripture? And they'll reject the one true God on the basis of some church tradition. In Jesus' day, a lot of people had rejected him. The religious leaders, the people you would think would be the guys behind him, they rejected him. The, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, the, the, the Jews in the Capernaum synagogue up north in Galilee, they rejected him. Some of his own followers, many of his own followers rejected him. They said, these sayings are too hard. And they, they, they walked away, leaving Jesus with only his 12 at the time. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths. Joe was doing some pop quizzes during the, uh, during the music. Um, we'll go ahead and ask you a couple of questions. Tell me something about the Feast of Booths. Tell me what you remember. What, what, does anyone remember around when in the time, of, what, what time of year, what months maybe the Feast of Booths takes place? Anyone remember that? Like, kind of now, like September, October. Um, when is Sukkoth? Sukkot? I have to look it up. We'd have to see. Yeah. Um, anyone remember why, what the Feast of Booths even was? Like, what, was, what were they remembering? Does anyone remember? Do you remember what they were remembering? Anyone? They're, they're remembering the time in the wilderness where they had to make booths. They had to live in these like temporary structures and where they had to rely on God to bring them water. And that was appropriate at that time of year because the, the, the dry season was coming to an end and the water was running out. And so Jesus is there. By the way, uh, how long before Jesus' death are we right now? Six months. We're about six, about about six months before Jesus is going to die. That's where we are in John 7 right now. And we've spent like three weeks or so in John 7, maybe four, I don't remember exactly. But this, this, is, this is really a significant passage to develop the theme of this opposition against Jesus and really who Jesus is. Jesus makes some, some pretty strong claims in this passage, true claims, but claims that people weren't ready to hear, hear. So it's about six months before Jesus' death, and the people have been debating who Jesus is, and there's been some confusion. You know, some people think he's a good man. Other people think he's leading the, the people astray. And the chief priests and the Pharisees, these are the guys who are kind of like in charge. So they are, you know, the council, the Sanhedrin, the rulers in Israel. They hear people talking about Jesus. They hear people debating about whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, and they don't like it. And so back in verse 32, a few weeks ago we looked at that, back in verse 32, they sent out a group of officers, a group of temple policemen, to go and arrest Jesus. 
because they've had it. Initially, they wanted to do this thing in secret. You know, let's, let's take him, you know, let's take him by night. Let's take him not in front of the crowd. Then it's like, enough is enough. We need to get him no matter what. We need to go arrest him. And they sent the temple police to go arrest Jesus. But they don't do that. The temple police, they don't arrest Jesus. They come back empty-handed. And when the religious leaders see this, they're tremendously frustrated. And that's what, kind of where we're picking up in John 7, verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, that is, the Pharisees said to the, to the officers, why did you not bring him? The temple police had gone out planning to arrest Jesus, but when they get to Jesus, they also heard the crowds. They hear the debate. They aren't convinced that Jesus is such a bad guy. And then they hear Jesus himself teaching, and they're like, Jesus is inviting people to receive him by faith. He's inviting people to receive living water. It's the water of life that God had prophesied back in the Old Testament in, in the prophets. And Jesus is inviting them. He's claiming to be the Messiah, inviting them to receive everlasting life. Can he be the Messiah, they think? And what if he is? If Jesus is the Messiah, how could they arrest him? Knowing that the Pharisees and the scribes and the council, that what they want to do. How could they arrest him? It would be the biggest mistake of their lives. And so they needed to kind of look into this a little bit more. So they don't arrest Jesus. Their job was to follow the orders of the council. But these guys, I mean, they're not thugs. You know what I mean? Um, they, they, they have a conscience. They have to do what's right. And so when they hear Jesus, and they're not sure who Jesus is, they go back empty-handed uh, without Jesus. And the Pharisees, they're, they're not so happy because the Pharisees, they're the ones who decide matters of faith, not Jesus in their minds. They're the ones who decide matters of faith, not the temple police. They're the ones who give orders and the temple police follow them. And so they're not happy with the temple policemen and they demand an answer. Why did you not bring him? Notice these officers' answer in verse 46. The officers answered, I love the way they put this. Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. We've never heard anyone like this before. They go to arrest Jesus. They hear him. They're they're amazed by how Jesus is teaching, by the authority that he teaches with, and we've never heard anything like this before. That's our excuse. Uh, Carson says, these temple police, they're not mercenaries or thugs, he says. They are Levites. That is, um, they come from the tribe of Levi, and... Uh, they are religious people. They may study the word of God. They are in and around temple service. They make a great sacrifice uh, by, and they're on a rotation. They make a great sacrifice by leaving wherever they live to travel all the way down to Jerusalem and be there and serve in the temple for a period of time. And so they're not going to just blindly follow sinful orders. They're not going to act against their conscience. And they choose not to arrest Jesus. Some perhaps on the basis of the confusion of the people, but most here on how Jesus speaks. He does not sound like a false prophet. He sounds like the Messiah. And they make their choice based on what Jesus says. Uh, besides, if they arrested Jesus, there would be an uproar. But they really would. They really would, because people are starting to, to buy into Jesus as the Messiah. And so their choice at the time was to wait. By the way, that's, that's not a bad option. You know, we live in a world that's, like, everything happens real quick. Like, you, you know, boom, 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 boom. One thing after another. You know, uh, someone writes a book, Crazy Busy. You know, we load our lives up with things, and, and you know, we want to take action quickly, and we want answers quickly. And uh, sometimes the best answer is to is just wait. You don't need the answer right now. I, I like to wait. I don't like, even if I'm pretty convinced 
that this is the right course of action, I like to wait. I like to, to, to at least take a day or two to, I like to sleep. I like to wake up the next day, maybe sleep again, wake up the day after that, and, and see how the thing's still sitting with me. I, that's, that's how I like to do things. Um, and so sometimes, you'd be surprised how many times people come to me and they want an answer, and they want an answer fairly quickly, and I'm just like, let me think about it. Now, I don't always tell them, I like what you're asking, and I agree, but I, you know, most of the time I do, but sometimes I just say, I'm not sure. I may be like 55, 45, and I'm like, let me just think about it. You know, I just, let me just wait. Sometimes it's the best thing to do is just wait until you get all the information, right? If you get every piece of information you need, wait. And then you make a decision. The scripture says, uh, a fool answers a matter before he hears it. You know what I mean? So you waiting is sometimes a good thing. It's not a quality in our world, but these guys waited. They waited. Um, don't be... Uh, don't misunderstand the situation. It's not like these guys have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They're not now followers of him. They just, they're waiting. They're not sure, just like the people. They're not sure about Jesus, and they err on the side of caution. We're not going to deliver this man over to these people who are against him. We're not sure yet. Notice the Pharisees' response. And by the way, uh, the title of this message reflects what's going to happen. I never showed you the title page. (laughs) manipulating about the Messiah. All right, so now I've kind of given you the heads up of what's, what's going to happen here. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? None of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. That is, a curse to the fires of hell. That's what the word means. To be accursed to the fires of hell. The Pharisees here are so manipulative. They don't want to talk about the matter. They don't want to look at scripture. They, they don't want to do their homework. They think they know best. And so they ask, I don't know, a leading question, a, manipul- a manipulative question. You have not also been led astray, have you? The way they ask it is kind of telling. It's manipulative. They're the ones who speak with authority. They think they have the authority. They think they know better than God. And if you're on the other end of this question, you have not also been led astray, have you? Here are your options. One, uh, yeah, we've been led astray. You know, like who's going to be like, yeah, I've been been deceived. I mean, that happens sometimes. I, I was talking to a man last week and um, not getting into the whole details of it, but he was, he was telling me how some guy was convincing him that the end of the world was coming and they bought into it and, you know, um, spent some money, spent some money because of this guy that had misled them who uh, consequently is an elder in a church. How do you become, how are you an elder in a church and convince people like a, like a lay pastor and convince people the world is ending and go spend all your money on you know, supplies. And, and he said to me, I was deceived. You don't often hear that. You don't often hear that type of humility. Most of the time people aren't going to be like, yeah, okay, yeah, I was deceived. Every once in a while you'll hear it. That's one option. Yeah, I've been deceived into following a false prophet or thinking about the false prophet. The other option is, no, we haven't been deceived. We should have arrested Jesus. So it's like, it's a manipulative way of asking the question. Uh, Instead of using reason, the Pharisees attack the opposing view uh, using emotionally charged language, assuming that anyone who took the opposite view was deceived. Uh, By the way, um, Donald Trump was the king at using emotionally charged language, at, um, at uh, mudslinging his, his foes. You know what I mean? Like you, 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 that's part of the reason why he won over the masses and the other, uh, other half of the people hate, 50% loved him, 50% hated him. I guess they say 50.5% hated him and 495 loved him. I don't know. I don't know what the numbers really are. But, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you, you know, people loved that. They loved that the guy... See, what we're used to was we're used to politicians who were deceptive. They were polite but deceptive. And the reason why people love Donald Trump is because he was honest, 
even if he was impolite. You know, he, was, he told you what he thought, no matter how bad he thought. You know, he told you, and you'd just be like sitting there like, oh man, that was, wow. He'd curse and swear, and the crowd would go crazy, and you'd just be like, oh, oh no, please don't, please stop. And he'd call like, you know, the other guy a name, and everyone would go nuts, and you'd just be like, oh, cringing, oh, please don't, <laughs> you know. But the people loved it because he was honest, because, but he used emotionally charged language, if you ever listen to him. Uh, that's what the Pharisees are doing. They're using emotionally charged language, and they're attacking any view that opposed their own. They're really strong-arming these temple police, and they, they use logical fallacies. That's like a false argument. So, if, so imagine that if you're arguing with people, imagine that there are like rules to arguing. There are like sound rules. Um, they're like rules of courtesy, they're rules of logic, like you, you're really supposed to follow certain rules when you argue with someone. A logical fallacy is when you break those rules. So using emotionally charged language like this is kind of breaking those rules a little bit. It's, it's assuming the other view's wrong, even though the other view hasn't been investigated yet. You understand? So, so we'd call that a logical fallacy. So that's not the first logical fallacy that they commit. They, they continue committing logical fallacies by, uh, the next logical fallacy would be a wrongful appeal to authority. Check this out. None of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? Uh, that is, they appeal to themselves as the authority. When in actuality, Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, wouldn't he be the authority? So the authority really hasn't been established in this case. So they are wrongfully appealing to authority, claiming authority that they don't technically have. And so they're trying to manipulate these temple police. You guys are compromisers. You guys are being led astray by a false prophet. You know, the real thinkers, you know, the smart people, the people that know the scriptures, we, we know who Jesus really is. None of us believes this. None believes. None believe. Yeah. None of the Pharisees has believed in him. Is that true? Well, first off, are they, are they the rightful authority? If Jesus is, is, is claiming to be Messiah, that's in question, right? So they're, we're not sure if they're really the rightful authority. But um, have any of the, has any of the Pharisees believed in him? I mean, as we'll see soon enough, these Pharisees are ignorant about a great many things. They don't even realize that some of their own believe in Jesus, even one of their most influential teachers, a man who is called the teacher of Israel. And I heard, I heard the name over here somewhere. I heard the name Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus, whom Jesus called the teacher of Israel. Nicodemus went to Jesus by night because he wasn't sure about who Jesus was. To, to learn from Jesus. The teacher, the great teacher of Israel went to Jesus by night to learn from Jesus. Uh, in a few chapters, we're going to see that uh, Nicodemus isn't the only one who believes in Jesus. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, many of the rulers, many even of the rulers believed in him. Many. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue. So, so they say, none of the Pharisees or rulers has believed in him, right? And then later on, we see many, many of them did, but they were afraid because they knew that if they believed in Jesus, that the rest of the Pharisees, the majority of the Pharisees, would have him kicked out of the synagogue. They'd get disciplined out of the synagogue. And so they were afraid to say anything publicly. Uh, the Pharisees then use a third logical fallacy in verse 49. But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. They don't know the law, and so they must be wrong. They're not trained the way we are. We know it, and so since we know the law, 
That is, since we have this training, and by the way, their training wasn't just in the Bible. I mean, it was in, the, it was in traditions. Since we know the traditions, we must be right. It's not possible that we could be wrong. Now try to imagine that type of thinking today. It's not possible that the pastor could be wrong on anything. Is that the type of guy you want to follow? Not even a chance he could be wrong. He's right every single time, and you're wrong. Wow, that's, these people are ignorant. They're cursed. If you believe in Jesus, you're ignorant too. Is that manipulation? That's manipulation there. This isn't about the law of Moses. Um, It's about authority. It's not even really about their traditions. Um, Again, the ancient rabbis trained on in the Mishnah as mo- really more so than the law of Moses. Uh, one, ancient, uh, one ancient said, if he has learned the scriptures, but not the Mishnah, he is an uneducated man. And so the Pharisaic mindset is anyone who thinks that Jesus is the Messiah is ignorant. And if you think that Jesus is the Messiah, you're ignorant. This is not something that we educated people would think. These ignorant people, they are accursed to the fires of hell. Consequently, if you believe in Jesus, you are too. That's the position the Pharisees are taking. Now, the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, might have something to say about that, right? And he does. Look at verses 50 and 51. Nicodemus, who came to him before, being one of them, he came to them in John 3, and in that passage, Jesus said, you must be born again. In that passage, uh, Jesus says, uh, 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 well, here, let's turn there, so I don't, let's misquote it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. in that conversation. In verse 50, Nicodemus, he who came to him before being one of them, being one of the Pharisees in that group, said to them, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing. Does it? Uh, Again, you might remember Nicodemus went, John 3, right? He went in secret but now he's getting a little more confident, a little more bold about you. Not quite defending Jesus, but all he's heard is logical fallacies. All he's heard is manipulation. And the one thing he hasn't heard is what God says. And so he brings up the thing that should have been brought up from the beginning. What does God actually say? It's the first smart thing I've seen in this entire passage. It's the only thing that's been said that hasn't broken the rules of logic. Nicodemus brings up what Scripture says. Our law does not judge man unless it first hears him and knows what he's doing. Listen to some of the the verses that stand behind what Nicodemus said. In Exodus 23.1, You shall not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Hearing the issue mattered. You couldn't judge a person without examining the evidence Look at Deuteronomy 1.16. Then I charge, Moses saying this, then I charge your judges at that time saying, here the case is between your fellow countrymen and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen or the alien who is with him. There's, there's a judgment that happens after you hear the case. This is Moses' first sermon to the people of Israel as they're outside of the promised land waiting to go in and inherit it. One of the first things he says in Deuteronomy 1. Over in Deuteronomy 19. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And if a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, if that happens, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. And the judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if that witness was lying, then he was going to get the punishment he was trying to bring 
on the other guy. If he was accusing the guy of murder and the punishment was death, that guy would die. That guy would die. Evidence matters. And it mattered then. Only a fool would answer a matter before he hears it. And it was against the law to hear, to answer a matter without hearing it. First logical thing we've heard in this passage so far comes out of Nicodemus' mouth. Later on, we're going to see Nicodemus get even more bold about Jesus, but we'll save that for later in the gospel. Um, Again, Nicodemus isn't necessarily defending Jesus here, but he is pointing people to follow the word of God. He believes that if you look at scripture, scripture will give the answer. He's calling for searching the scriptures. Notice the Pharisees' scathing response in verse 52. They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Um, Logic? Fair trial? Search the scripture? Nope. Nope. This was uh, Donald Trump at his finest during campaign time, right? <laughs> Donald Trump calling the name, calling, you know, Sleepy Joe. By the way, he's pretty sleepy, right? I mean, come on, leaves right about that one. But um, this is, you know, you are not also from Galilee of the Gentiles. You must be ignorant like the people of Galilee. There must be something wrong with you. Remember, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so there's more manipulation, more mudslinging. They appeal to Scripture, but in a manipulative way. Search and see. Look for yourself that no prophet arises out of Israel. Examine the Scriptures and, and you'll see for yourself. Uh, now, they're wrong about a number of things. Um, first off, uh, there are prophets that come out of out of Galilee, uh, Nahum was from Galilee. Jonah was from Galilee. Okay, so, uh, you know, a couple of guys actually come from Galilee. But, but let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And let's assume that they're talking about the prophet. And they're talking about not just any prophet, but the prophet like Moses. Right? Let's assume that that's what they're saying, that no prophet like Moses arises out of Galilee. And that they would be right about to a certain extent, um, that is as far as origins, as far as birth. But if these guys would do their homework, they would know that Jesus wasn't born in Galilee. See, these guys know that Micah 5.2 says that, that the Messiah comes from Bethlehem of Ephrata, right? Uh, and they understand that Jesus is from Nazareth. But if they did their homework, they might come to find that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. And so they're wrong about a great many things. Right? Uh, these guys are, are claiming that their audience, that the, that, that the people are ignorant, but they are proving themselves to be ignorant. By the way, ignorant people use logical fallacies, false arguments. They break the rules um, when they argue because they don't know what they're talking about. Every once in a while, I'll have like a Jehovah's Witness show up at my door. They haven't shown up in years. They, they walk on the other side of the street for the most part. The last time I saw Jehovah's Witness, I'm pretty sure I was chasing them down the street, calling them false prophets. Um, so I think they've marked my house as don't go there. Um, I, I, I'm quite sure I've seen them cross the street uh, when they get close to my house and, you know, walk on the other side. But, um, but they are false prophets. Every once in a while, Jehovah's Witness would come to my house, and they'll bring up Greek. And I'll say oh, let me bring out my Greek New Testament. Let's look at it. And I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who claim to know Greek, and it only takes one question to figure out that they don't. I'm not going to tell you what the question is, but because um, then you'll study the answer and pretend to know. But if they got through the first one, I'd ask them the second one, and then they'd be done. So it only takes one question to figure out if someone actually knows any, like, the, the, the most, like, rudimentary, elementary levels of Greek. It only takes one question to figure out if the guy has any, any knowledge of the language. And so I ask the question, and they just want to change the subject, because now they've been exposed as frauds. So they claimed to be authorities in, say, a language that they don't know, Right? Because they might know like some little fact that someone told them because they got spoon-fed some false, false theology 
you know, uh, I, I come across that. Ignorant people tend to use, they tend to break the rules of logic. But the Pharisees here are the ones who are ignorant, not the temple police. I mean, they may be ignorant. They're trying to figure things out. Not Jesus, certainly. Jesus knows all things. I mean, he was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. The Pharisees are the ones who are ignorant. And it's precisely because they didn't hear the matter. They didn't search the script. They didn't search the script. They didn't search. They didn't ask Jesus. They didn't have an open mind about who Jesus was. They should have listened to the advice of the teacher of Israel, but instead they're ignorant. They stay in their ignorant ignorance, and they reject Jesus on the basis of their false understanding. Their main argument against him is what? What's their main scriptural argument against Jesus? They have one argument against Jesus at this point. Scripturally, what, what's the argument? I mean, I, I suppose you could say there's a second one in there somewhere, but in this passage, there's one main argument. Anyone? Where he's from, right? Their main argument against Jesus is no prophet comes out. <laughs> prophet comes out of Galilee? Well, what if that was discredited? What if they were open to what Scripture said? What if it was discredited? I, I mean, listen, I think we all know they're going to reject Jesus no matter what. But their only scriptural argument would be discredited. But they'd rather remain in their ignorance. There are a lot of people like that today. There are a lot of people who reject Jesus without doing their homework. They reject the one true gospel. And there is one true gospel. And that's what Paul says in Galatians 1. Uh, in fact... Galatians 1. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a, a different gospel. And the best way to translate this is the way the ESV translates it. Not that there is another gospel. There is one true gospel and there is a distorted gospel. Only there are some who are disturbing you and they want to, look at the word here, distort the gospel. There is one true gospel and there's a distorted gospel. The one true gospel is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and the completed work of Christ on the cross alone. It's the only way a person can be saved. Abby was talking about that earlier. Then there's a distorted gospel that says, well, yeah, but I need to get baptized. Yeah, but I need to follow the sacraments. I need to take communion. I need to confess my sins to a priest or whomever. I need to give money. To the church, you need to be a good person. I need to feed the homeless. Well, those are all things you should do. I mean, I mean, I don't know about all things, but you understand, like, you need to confess your sins to a priest. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but, but I mean, many of those things are things you should do, but they don't earn any grace with God. They don't contribute to your salvation. That's a distorted gospel. It's a false gospel. And the mainline denominations, they claim to believe our gospel, but they practice that distorted gospel sacramental salvation. I was talking to a Lutheran priest who said to me, yes, those items, we would believe that those items contribute, they, they, they impart God's grace. And my response was, then my understanding of scripture is that you're not saved and you need to be saved. That was a hard conversation over breakfast <laughs> with, uh, with the local former local Lutheran priest, where I basically told them, you're lost. People will set themselves against him. They'll do anything they can to discredit the word of God. This is big in the homosexual community and other communities where they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and they reject the truth. They're not the only ones. All types of group, groups reject the gospel. In this passage, we see how the religious leaders ignorantly used logical fallacies. That is, they broke the rules of logic uh, to try to discredit the most logical being that exists, the one true Messiah. They, in their pride, set themselves up as the authority instead of submitting to the one true authority who is Jesus Christ. And because of it, they're going to end up in the lake of fire. 
They are the ones who are accursed, not the people. The Pharisees will spend eternity in hell because they rejected the gospel. Don't you make the same mistake. Jesus is the Messiah. And you are not the authority. Now, a lot of people think, you know, Scripture is about me. All these passages of Scripture, they're about me. You know, and, uh, and church is about me and, you know, whatever. No, none of it's about you. None of it's about you. It's all about him. He is the Messiah and you're a sinner. And you're not worthy of him. You're a sinner who's in trouble with God. That's what I loved here. And I loved hearing that out of that testimony. You know, you can't fix the situation. You can't like be better and fix it. You can't get baptized and fix it. You can't give money to the church and fix it. You can't join a church to fix it. You're condemned to hell because of your sin and God is just and he must punish sin. That's what you are. You're a sinner who's in trouble with God who can't fix the situation. So don't think you're the authority and don't think you're the, uh, what's the word I want to use here, the, uh, the authority on uh, ethics. You know, my God would never dot, dot, dot. Don't think you're the guy who has the corner on truth because you're not. You're a sinner just like me who can't save yourself, who's in trouble with God. You can't fix the situation. And God is just and he must punish sin, but he's also, he also loves you with an everlasting love and that's why he sent his son. He sent his son to take your place, to become your substitute so that he sent his son. He actually says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He became your sin. Your sins were placed on him at the cross so that you might become the righteousness of God in him. He came to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins on your behalf, a penalty you could never pay. And so you remember who you are and who God is. Pharisees didn't quite figure that one out. They thought they were the ones who had the corner on truth. They thought they were the ones who were the authority. Wrongful appeal to authority, emotionally charged language, right, all this stuff. If you place your faith in Jesus' work on the cross, you will have everlasting life. If you repent, that is, if you turn away from your, this is what repentance is. If you turn away from your sin, if you change your mind such that you turn away from your sin, that's, that's what it is. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind about who I am. I've changed my mind about my ability to save myself or about the sacraments or whatever. There are no sacraments. A sacrament is a work whereby you earn the grace of God. There are no sacraments. There are ordinances. There are traditions. There are symbols. I change my mind such that I turn away from my sin and I turn towards God in faith. I've placed my faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Salvation, the one true gospel of salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and the completed work of Christ on the cross alone. Sola scriptura, sola fide, right? Faith alone. You need to place your faith in Jesus the Messiah. You need to examine the evidence of Scripture, which clearly shows us by means of fulfilled prophecy who Jesus is over and over and over again, that Jesus is who he says he is. And if Jesus is who he says he is, then the right response is to repent and commit my life to his service. It's to place my faith in Jesus Christ. That's how I get saved. And then as a result of my salvation, not in order to get saved, but as a result of it, because I'm saved, now I live my life for Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that, you'll be accursed. In the fires of hell for all eternity. I didn't say it, God did. You just bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. No one looking around but me. Um, you're here and you're, you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm not 100% sure I'm saved. If that's you, would you just kind of raise your hand up or, or even just look at me if you're a little embarrassed to raise your hand. You raise your hand up or look at me and that'll tell me I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I see that. I see that. You can put your head down. I see that. Put your head down. 
Anyone else? I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. You're here and you, you know you're saved. You know you have everlasting life. But uh, you've let some things slip. And um, you haven't... There's some things you need to repent of in your life. And you want to do that today. Would you just uh, raise your hand up? I'll pray for you. Uh, there's some things in my life I want to repent of today. And I'd like you to pray for me. Anyone like that today? Heavenly Father, we come before you and praise you and lift up your name. And we pray for these three who are unsure of their salvation. And Lord, we pray that you would have them to, to come to know your one true gospel and to place their faith in your completed work on the cross. I pray for anyone else who maybe didn't raise up their hand. Um, I pray that you would continue to work on their hearts and convict them until, uh, make things difficult for them even until they come to a point where they, they need to repent and place their faith in you. I pray for others who perhaps uh, I saw no hands, but you know, uh, need to repent of some things in their lives. And I pray that you would convict them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you take your hymnals, I don't, I don't have 400, 400. If you take your hymnals, turn to 400. Uh, we're going to close our service with a hymn.